The Maple Leafs can wrap up home ice with a victory against the Tampa Bay Lightning tonight. We'll preview that game. We'll give you some injury updates from around the Maple Leafs and also touch on maybe what the future could be with Jake Muzzin with this Leafs club, not only this year, but maybe even into the future. All that more coming up on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked on Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother from TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also now catch us up on video on YouTube, Locked On Leafs on youtube as we we reach our new goal is a thousand subs dave thousand subs i think we're close to 600 so we still need 400 of y'all to go and sub up before we initiate our next giveaway so let's try and get that done uh, asap at least I, if we can get that done before the playoffs that'd be most ideal but certainly before the year is all all finished up and a long playoff run will give us a much longer run to make that achievement happen uh and speaking of playoff runs dave uh, and the playoffs in general, tonight could very well be a playoff preview of round one. As it sits today, if the playoffs were to start, it would be Toronto versus Tampa Bay in round one. That's who they got tonight on the ice. We'll preview that game in just a few moments. But before we kind of get into all that, um, we'll do some some injury updates around the team. Uh, Sandine uh, was skating with the team yesterday. He will not travel and join the club this week as they head out on the road. Same with Andre Kasha, which is a very positive sign that he was out there on the ice with his teammates. Also not going to join, but both Jake Muzzin and Austin Matthews, um, who didn't play last night, expected to play in the game uh, tonight against Tampa Bay, and they will join the team on the upcoming road trip. Now, the interesting name to talk about out of that whole group, I think is Jake Muzzin right now. There's a lot of buzz going on on Twitter. A clip surfaced yesterday. I believe it was David Alter who took this photograph of Maple Leafs hot stove, or it was a, a video rather, posted it on his Twitter timeline of Jake Muzzin doing some skills work ahead of the morning skate. And this was ahead of the morning skate. Let's also get that. Here's here's the video here for those who are on uh, on YouTube. Um, if you want to play a little bit a little bit of this clip. It's, it's Jake Muzzin, and he's just kind of skating around, tooting around a little bit. Doesn't look all that too, you know, quick. And it just it's just a weird video, weird vibes and whatnot. Like, what's your takeaway from, uh, from this whole setup? And you can see him right here. Looks like he might be laboring a little bit, hands on his knees, bending over. What's your take on this, Jake Muzzin? You concerned about this little video at all? I mean, after all, Dave, we talk about practice. Yeah, obviously. I mean, we're now trying to dissect something out of, you know, a practice clip. But yeah, I, I didn't see, at first I didn't see the full clip of him skating away and clearly laboring with something. Um, we're, we're all just trying to deduce what exactly is going on here. I'll keep it. I'll keep playing it with uh, some of the other snipes happening. That's Kasha, um, by the way, right there in the red sweater. Kasha, I think Matthews at one point will snipe on. Uh, yeah. I think Sam it's Dean's out there, Matthews out there, and Jake Muzzin. All the all the injured guys were out there getting uh, getting some work in. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm. It doesn't look good when a guy like Jake Muzzin, who's been out for so long, comes back a few games and he's already out again. And you can tell in that sequence, there's clearly something amiss. I like I don't know if it's got to do something. We know he's had groin issues in the past. We know he's had – I mean, I I don't like to assume. We also know he's had back issues where he's had to wear a brace before. It's clearly something that when he made that turn or when he tried to make a move, it, it just was, it wasn't working out for him. And that's concerning to me because once the physicality drives up in the playoffs, 
Is he going to be able to sustain? Is he going to be able to handle that as part of, you know, his recovery process? I just don't know. It just seems like, you know, he's doubled down. He can't like, if, if you look here, he's still, he was still doubled down along the boards. It's clear that something is hampering him. And I don't know how much that's going to improve. You know, this was taken on Tuesday. I don't know how much that's going to improve with the team going out on the road trip. Maybe some Florida sun will do him so good because I know I'm I'm laboring a bit with this Toronto weather right now. Yeah, like we're watching him for a second time kind of go around and he's looking a little ginger, I guess. Not looking as crisp and sharp as Kasha and Matthews and Sandine. Now, given those three players... You know they're uh, they're they all got much more skill, I suppose, than than Jake Muzzin. But the foot speed and skating has kind of been the the biggest issue for him, I think, this year. And it, you know it's it's kind of on display in this clip. I think we can probably bring the clip down at this point. Um, it's on display here, right? Like those concerns of him maybe looking his age at this point, as he's you know up now over thirty years old. I guess the next question is, Dave, like how confident would you be in Jake Muzzin being in this team's top six come game one, if that's the Jake Muzzin that we're getting and look, there's still five games to go for him to ramp things up, I suppose. And, and we're not sure if he's going to play tonight. He's joined the team on the road trip. I would think he's going to try, but whether or not that actually happens remains to be seen. But with five games to go, do you feel like Jake Muzzin can get himself into a position where he is one of the top six defensemen on this team or might he be a guy who might be sitting in the press box come game one of the playoffs? Uh, I, if if he's not able, <coughs> sorry, if he's not able to get anywhere close to being like, if if this is something where he's continuing to be dealing with something, I just don't see the point, right? It's not like the Toronto Maple Leafs are in a desperate cry to get Jake Muzzin back. That was part of the reason why Mark Giordano was brought in here. TJ Brody can play the left side. He's he hasn't had that much trouble with it. So is and you know if Sandine's coming back too, that even makes it more interesting in that regard. I I just think this team did a better job to insulate themselves from having to rush Jake Muzzin back. And I don't want a guy who is going to have that injury issue in the back of his mind as they're playing. You know, they're the toughest hockey of the year i i just don't want that to be a concern for him and that that you know bleeds into his play yeah like i that so that's the argument for jake muzzin potentially not getting into the lineup just flat out if he's not good enough he's not good enough uh but at the same time like he's a veteran of the league he's a a, a part of the, this team's leadership and he knows how to play in the playoffs Right, he's been there. He's done that. He's won a championship. I think he's one of the only couple of players on this team that has a Stanley Cup ring in their back pocket. So he does bring, you know, a wealth of knowledge and experience. But that's what the old Jake Muzzin brought. Can this new, slowed down Jake Muzzin bring you a lot of the same, or could guys like a Lilligren or a Labushkin, like that lineup that they showed last night? or the game against Philly, is that maybe the the most optimal lineup that this team could give you? Like, perhaps it is. And I think it's an interesting question that uh, that's going to get answered over the, the next five games. We'll see if he plays tonight. Like I said, he's on the road trip. We're just not so confident that that he's a, he's definitely not 100%. We know that. That's why he's, he's missed the last three games. He's dealing with something. It's an un, undisclosed injury at this point, which means – could be a groin, could be a knee, and that would explain why he's skating around so gingerly in that clip there. But at the end of the day, man, Jake Muzzin, he's got to play better to stay in the lineup. I think at this point, um, if he's not one of the top six players on the ice, I'm not sure you can afford to you know, just have him there based on merit being a, a veteran in the league. He may spend some games up in the press box, it's going to suck, but, uh, I mean, everyone, you know, everyone's time comes where they're just not as good as they once used to be or how, how good they, they want to be. And with Jake Muzzin, a couple of injuries and back-to-back years, a couple of concussions, you know, perhaps 
it's starting to turn the other ways. He's he's already reached that point where his play's starting to dip and decline. And you've got other guys who are surpassing him on the depth chart. Timothy Lilligren, one of those guys who's playing extremely well at this point, who may be one of the better six defensemen on this team. And he wasn't really factored into it earlier in the season. We'll see. We'll see what ends up happening with uh with old Muzzy Boy over there. Uh, before we get into the game tonight against the Leafs and the Tampa Bay Lightning, Dave, why don't you tell uh, our good listeners about our friends over at Shady Rays? Yes, uh, our good friends at Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, <clears throat> well-constructed durable frames, and premium High-end finishes. Also, something you won't find anywhere else is Shady Ray's insane protection program. Shady Ray's includes lost and broken protection on every pair. They will send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happened. Give them a try, and if you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's as simple as that. Plus, 10 meals are donated to Fight Hunger in America when you shop with Shady Ray's. Exclusive for our listeners, head to ShadyRays.com and use the promo code Locked On to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code locked on for their best deal of the season. 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Rays glasses backed over by 150,000 verified five-star reviews. And uh, the weather's starting to turn, starting to get nice outside. All the last couple of days hasn't been too great, but spring's around the corner, which means uh, sunglass season is upon us. So definitely go check out our friends at Shady Rays. They'll get you all hooked up uh, just in time for beach season. Speaking of beach season, you know, the Maple Leafs, they're down in Tampa where it's beach season 24-7. Get yourself some Shady Rays down there. You'll be able to wear those things freaking 365 days a year on the beach but uh Leafs in Tampa I mean this is a big game for a couple of reasons one this could be a potential playoff preview between these two teams for round one and also the Leafs can wrap up home ice with a win tonight what are you expecting out of the buds is this a game that uh you certainly circle as as one you're waking up for unlike what we saw the other night against Philly I think so I, I think that this club when the chips are down and they need to have a big game against a good opponent. They're capable of doing it. And I think it says something that even when they don't play at their best, like they did against the Flyers, they came away with the win. We've seen about, you know, hit, the, kick them in the butt against teams like Buffalo. But I, I truly believe that they understand whether it's Tampa or Boston, you want to give yourself the best advantage and, Correct me if I'm wrong. They've never had home ice against Boston in all those series. No. Nope. So if there ever is that, you know, dreaded game seven scenario, rather be in your own barn rather than in a hostile environment, whether in Tampa or Boston. And I, I think you got you, you don't want to mess up the opportunity because you weren't ready for the moment. I wonder what's interesting about this Tampa Bay Lightning team. We've talked about how much that they've, somewhat hit a skid here over the last little bit. Um, you know, last, I think, 10 or so games, like in, in the month of April, actually. So, so far through the month of April, 10 games, uh, the team's sitting here, they're 4-4-2, four, four, and two, and they've actually got a, a negative goal differential at 5-on-5. Five five. The Tampa Bay Lightning with a negative goal differential. Who would have thunk? Who would have thought that that would be the case here, Dave? It's so strange. I mean, <clears throat> we saw it with the L.A.s and the Chicago's that after so many playoff runs, the team just need. It, there's only so much that a team like you that. Buy, can yeah, like are you buying into the fatigue factor here with Tampa Bay? And like I, I've seen a couple of people kind of commenting because we've discussed this a couple of times. How oh, you're sleeping on Tampa? I'm not sleeping on Tampa. I still think that regardless, if that's who the Maple Leafs have to play, it's going to be a difficult matchup. I'm not saying that the Leafs are going to roll over Tampa Bay. Of course not. They know how to play. But it is slightly concerning down the stretch. And when you just factor in everything, the fact that it's been back-to-back -back years, long playoff uh, runs, condensed off-seasons, condensed schedules, a lot has been going on. Um, with this team and with hockey and sports in the world over the last couple of years that maybe fatigue is starting to to set in here. It could be the case. 
there's only like there's only so much a team like Tampa can do. Like let's not forget there was also the playing round, the bubble. Yeah. You know, that was a lot of hockey that these guys have played. And you know, there's a reason why there hasn't been a three peed in the NHL in so long. It's just become that much tougher to play the way that these teams play all year. And, you know, there's a reason why in certain, uh, when you see it in the NBA with, with load management, there's a reason why these teams do it. It's not because the stars don't want to play against certain teams. No, the stars are just like, I want to, I don't want to be tired when the playoffs come around. Cause what's the point of giving it all during a regular season only for it to fall apart in the playoffs. Part of me also, believes that's been a part of the least problem is they've had to push so hard in the regular season in the playoffs you run out of gas very easily yes these are high profile athletes who are supposed to be in the best condition possible but there's only there's a different type of wear and tear that these guys go through than a lot of other like contact sports it it, it eats into your ability to stay fresh all year long and play deep into May and June like Tampa has the last. I mean, look, two two straight seasons of winning the Stanley Cup. They've gone the distance. It's not easy. And, you know, if they lose out early, some of the players I feel like, yeah, I'll be disappointed they don't get the three-peat, but it'll also be like now we can finally get that, you know, that rest that we haven't had because we've just been so good. Right, right. Yeah, so – you know, I guess that uh, if you're looking a glass half full approach after if they were to get eliminated early, I suppose that would be it. Um, as for tonight, Dave, this is a question that I was kind of tossing up myself. I was trying to think of if if I liked it or not. Like what what do you roll with the similar lines that you played with against Philly? Like you think Blackwell, Tavares, and Mikheyev get another look? It sounds like that third line of Nylander, Kerfoot, and Engball are going to get some extended looks here down the stretch. So that makes a whole lot of sense. And then if Matthews ends up playing, you obviously just slide him in over Abruzzese. Or do you think we're going to see you know some more switch ups here? Like what do you expect the lineup to look like tonight? I think you're going to see something similar. I, I really do. Um, I, I think, like, really what's what, what really could change? Like, I don't see them moving Tavares and uh, and, and Mikheyev away from each other. So it's really that, that guy that's running shotgun with the two of them. Um, Blackwell, I think they want to see what they have there. This is the time where you do it. Yeah, you, you get somewhat of an idea against a team like Philadelphia, but you really get a sense against a team like Tampa who are, you know, four lines deep. This is a team that if you're, if you're looking to match up and see how you match up, you're going to do it against a team that has the depth to go along with it. Obviously Matthews is availability as we're recording this. We don't know if he's going to play or not. That's going to determine a lot of it. Right. But I, I think, you got to at least try it because you have to see what's going to be the best way. Cause you can always revert back to old lines. If early in the game, it just does not work out. Sheldon Keith knows what he can go back to. I think that's, that's something that you keep in mind in a game like this. Yes. There, as we mentioned in the previous segment, that this is a game that they can, you know, get something out of it in terms of home ice advantage. So you don't want to, mess that up just to try some experimentation too much but at the same time you're you're actually trying to co- definitively set your your game plan for the playoffs and this is the time you have to do it yeah it'll be an interesting game tonight i think it's it's going to be a playoff esque style game both squads going to want to take it to the other team just as the little preview i mean tampa they're not really locked into that third spot. I think there's what one point difference between Tampa and Boston right now. Um, you know, we're recording the day before, I suppose. So I don't do either of those teams play tonight. I don't think they do. Maybe Boston does, but I know Tampa doesn't, but as of now, neither of them do. They're within a point of each other. So like, you know, they, if they don't want to fall out of the wild card spot, I mean, they got to try and win tonight. Too, right so they're both going to be in a good position to to want to play well i'd be curious to see who gets a, that top line assignment though 
spoke about a little bit yesterday how I felt that that Tavares, Mikheyev, Blackwell line almost serves as more of a, a checking line than it does like a top six traditional top six line. I'd be curious to see if they end up getting the the matchup against uh, like the Kucherov and Stamkos and uh, wh- whoever they're playing with at the time. That, that lineup's always different too. I think that's what makes these two teams so good. It's kind of the the flexibility within the lineup to do different things and still have that success, right? Like the NHL is such a Mickey Mouse league and most pro sports are not just the NHL. And who's the team who's been on top after the last couple of seasons? It's Tampa Bay lightning. So you talk about the flexibility, the depth that they have on the blue line on the back end. Clearly they had the advantage of net with, with world-class goaltender on Vasilevsky. But at the end of the day, like it's it's just such a great matchup, and uh, I think I think that the Maple Leafs they typically wake up for these games. Should be a fun one. Should be a fun one tonight. Uh, why don't we take one more quick break, and then we get back. Let's do some cosine, no sign, Dave. One of our favorite weekly segments here on the podcast. And uh, if you do believe that the Maple Leafs pull it out tonight, you can. Make a wager at betonline.net. You certainly can do that. And uh, betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sport developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, the NHL playoffs, and the start of the Major League Baseball season. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sport wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online. It's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked on Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano. Got Dave Morissuti with me. We're your host here of Locked on Leafs, a daily Maple Leafs podcast in which you can find via audio form wherever you get your podcast. And we're also now up on YouTube. Would really appreciate it if you went and subscribed to us on YouTube. Leave a comment, a like, all that jazz. It would uh, really help with the algorithm, which could help us gain in popularity. I think it'd be cool. And we're on our road to a thousand and uh, we need uh, just, just over 400 more subs to get there. So we're over halfway there, but still a little ways to go. Um, we're going to play some cosine, no sign, Dave. Uh, this is one of our favorite segments. We do it each and every week. Uh, I'm going to make a statement. And if you agree with it, you co-sign it. If you disagree with it, you no sign it vice versa with you and I, we both have three statements prepared. For this section, uh, you go first. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> um, cosign, no sign. Mitch Marner reaches 100 points on the season on this Florida road trip. Ooh, on the road. What's he sitting at right now? 95? 95. Five points in two games. Oh, on the Florida road trip yeah. or the road trip entirely? I was going to say the Florida road trip. Um, how many actually? Maybe they got maybe. one more. They got one more against Washington after that. Okay, we'll do the road trip. We'll give them three games. We won't make okay. it too tough on me. If they're giving me the extra game, I'll co-sign it. Okay. I'll co-sign that. I mean, to get to average, I guess, two and a half points against two top teams, I, I don't know. Although that said, these have always been high-scoring games between these two teams. And if it's Sorry. a high-scoring game. Mitch Martin is usually involved, so I could see it happen. But if you give me the other game against Washington, whom the Leafs have also had a lot of success over this year, including that 7-3 pumping that I was in the building for, uh, co-sign it. Absolutely. I think he certainly gets to 100 for the first time in his career. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I'll co-sign it. He'll get to 100. By the, by the time they get back to Canada, he will be a 100-point man. Co-sign. Love, love to hear. Yeah, I think he he's just been. If you if you have any qualms about Mitch Marner's salary, that's your prerogative. I think he's brought it this season. Who's brought that up in months? No one. Nobody has brought that yeah, up in man. months. Like you're comparing now. Oh, he makes this amount of money compared to who? Like like he's now one of the league's best players. He's deserving. To make what's he making 10 9 3 11 million let's say dude he's earning it he's earning every every single dollar of that money it's crazy the guy's the the leading score in the nhl since was it the uh, january 15th when he returned off the covid list been on a tear 
a tear across the NHL. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, my first one for you is also Mitch Marner related. This one comes, this is essentially, actually, and yeah, I'm going to give some love to one of our, let me actually find it. I'm going to give some love to one of our listeners of the podcast here because he's the one who kind of brought it up to me and it's Ron Sampson. And he said, why is nobody talking about Mitch Marner for the Selkie trophy? And I got to tell you, I think he belongs in the conversation. So cosign or no sign, Mitch Marner should be getting way more love for the Selkie trophy and will finish on the ballot. Ooh, that's a good one there. Um, ugh. I think he'll get on the ballot. <clears throat> I think there's a good chance he'll get third. It depends on who's who you're asking, right? There, when everybody talks about, you know, the Selkie, you never hear Mitch Marner's name. Um, the Athletic actually had a really good article about that. Uh, Shanna Goldman actually wrote about this, and. Traditionally, the Selkie has always been about, if you look at it, it's mostly centers that go on, on that battle. Yeah. Bergeron, O'Reilly, some people have brought in Elias Lindholm, Barkov. So even some people have put Matthews over Marner, which yeah. in some cases people are saying, well, he doesn't play. Uh, kill. Matthews doesn't play on the penalty kill, which you know, most defensive situation you can put for a for. I just think the numbers speak too much on Patrice Bergeron and what he's been able to do that he likely wins it. But I think there's a good chance Marner gets into the conversation of the top five, but three is where I'm going to put his ceiling because I just think there's going to be guys that will have just based off of reputation will be above Marner. All right. All right. Yeah. I, the center winger debate always is something that pops up with this and, I think also uh, I, I I saw the piece that Shana wrote and she touched on saying that it, it, not only is it center based but it's also like who's the best it's transformed into not who's the best defensive forward but who's the best two way forward as opposed to the best defensive which was what this originally was supposed to be right and and it's turned into okay who plays both ways better than anybody else. And um, Mitch Marner at this point in his career, um, especially this year, right up there with the best of them for who plays a two-way game. Uh, his offensive numbers speak for himself, but also like what he's been able to do on the penalty kill has been exceptional. And to speak to Austin Matthews, pretty sure he still leads the NHL in takeaways among all forwards. So that's pretty impressive as well when you yeah. talk about uh, defensive metrics, when you're quite literally – Taking the puck away from the opposition usually means uh, you're, you're doing good things defensively. Uh, all right. Second one for you, Dave. Go ahead. Second one for me is not Leafs related. I've been keeping an eye on the NHL scoring race. And I don't know if you noticed, Jonathan Huberdeau put himself atop of it after moving past Connor McDavid. So my question here is, uh, or my statement is, Jonathan Huberdeau, Keeps the scoring lead and wins the Art Ross Trophy. Oh, that is such a good one, dude. Florida's won 11 games in a row. And they're just destroying teams and offensively. Just dummying teams. It's gross what they've been able to do over the last little bit here. Really, it's basically since, since Toronto beat them. <laughs> like They've just been on a roll since we beat them 5-2. Um Back in like late March, I think it was. They've just been on a roll here. Um, wow, Jonathan Hoobs. How many games left for both of these squads? So there's 76 games played for Florida. So there's still six games to go for them. And same thing for Edmonton. So they both have the same amount of games left. Yeah. Oh, gosh. This is so – I'm going to no sign it. I'm going to no sign it because if you're, I never bet against McDavid and what that guy can do. And when I look at those two teams in particular, Florida doesn't have much to play for. They've already wrapped up home ice advantage. They've got the division. 
uh, already pretty much wrapped up here. And also, I'm pretty sure they got, what, a 10-point lead on Carolina for even, like, Eastern Conference to have it all the way through to the uh, – all the way through if they get that far, at least to the Eastern Conference Championship. So they're not playing for much. So they could end up sitting Huberto for a game or two. So maybe you get at Calgary or Edmonton, who still is – they're only two points up on L.A. They had a couple of games in hand, but they're playing for something over there in uh in edmonton still so i'm gonna roll with mcdavid also don't don't bet against mcdavid it's just that's just stupid to bet well, against that guy I, I saw one person say john uh johnny gaudreau should get some love too because he's he's just three points behind and he's been on a Dude, tear that guy's murdering any goaltender defensive core that he goes up against lately yeah that would be something man if that guy ends up winning the 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 scoring race, I wonder, which leads into my next cosine no sign. Austin Matthews, despite missing the past couple games, will still end up becoming the heart winner. This is so interesting because I read that having the aren't the Leafs six and one in the last seven games without Austin Matthews? They are. Some people are going to be like, well, how valuable can he really be if the Leafs still win without him in the lineup? I know. And you look at the season Goudreau has had and the finish that he is having here. Like, he's crept up. It's almost 50-50 at this point, Dave. I truly believe that. I also think that those who are voting for the heart will look at Matthew's points per game and not just, you know, looking at points. And what Matt – I just think – what it, it's not just the value of Matthews, whether he's in and out of the lineup, because when you look at what he's in the lineup, there's no player better on the Leafs. Like there, we can't say there's a player more valuable on the Leafs than Austin Matthews. And I think that's where, <clears throat> that's where the argument I think lies with also with Calgary. John Gaudreau is really good. Some people would, might even say, is he more valuable than a Kachuk or Elias Lindholm? I've heard that argument at, at some points. Now, lately, John Gaudreau's made that base that point almost invalid because of the way he's played. Right. But do you think if if uh, if Car- if Calgary doesn't have Johnny Gaudreau, they're worse off? I don't know because they still have other guys that can step up. Um, I don't know, man. That guy's it's so tough. Crazy. I still think Matthews. And he's picked up his game on the defensive side of things yes. too. That's something that that doesn't get talked a lot. Like. Goudreau, first of all, plus minus, whatever you want to say about the stat, when you're a plus 61, plus 61, it says something. You're on the ice 61 more times when you score a goal than when you are scored on. That still says something about the way that you play on both ends of the ice. Um, And at five on five, Johnny Goudreau does lead the NHL 70 points at five on five. And of those 70, only eight are secondary. So 62 of his 70 points at five on five this year are second or are, are uh, primary points, which means he's the one who's driving a lot of that play. I don't know, man. I've almost talked myself into Johnny hockey and a lot of it is honestly recency bias with Matthews kind of getting slowed down by pl- not playing a couple of games and Johnny hockey going off in those days to really bring it to kind of a standstill at this point. It's wild. It's wild. Um, Third one for you, Dave. So third one for me has to do with um, good old Mr. Michael Bunting. Mm, We had the same one, I bet. Michael Bunting finishes with the rookie goals and points lead. Mm, Goals and points lead. Let's see where he's at right now. I know he's leading in points, but he's what? One shy of Tanner Janot for goals, I want to say. Yep. He's got 23. Janot's got 24. Yeah, I'm going to co-sign this. Um, He's on fire right now, too. Like The floodgates have opened for him. They have. Like this dude, he's got multi-point games in five of his last ten. He rattled off three straight multi-point games before last night. Like, the guys, he's getting it done. He's putting the puck in the back of the net again after going on that, what was that, 18 straight games, 17 or 18 games in a row without scoring. 
the fact that he still is only one goal back of the rookie lead after an 18 game stretch of not scoring just goes to show like how great that middle portion of his season was. Um, yeah. But ultimately, yeah, I think that he's going to do it. He's still playing with Marner and Matthews and they're just firing on all cylinders at the same time. And he's playing extremely well himself. So yeah, I'm going to co-sign it, which Michael Bunting, my next co-sign no sign has to do with him as well. Michael Bunting, will win the Calder. Oh, man. I He's going to be a finalist. I still think people picked Maurice Sider like a month into the season. That has, like, it hasn't changed. I hate when that happens, though. Like, people oh, yeah. cling on to the first little bit of information that they get, and they hold on to it thinking, you know, th- this, is, this is for real. This is true. And... Early on in the year, it did seem like he had it pretty well locked up. And then Michael Bunting slowly and surely chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And at this point, when you go and you look at the numbers, and I saw Evolving Wild actually put out a tweet about this yesterday as well. And they said, Michael Bunting, according to our model, is by a mile having the better rookie season than anyone else in the conversation. Like it was Michael Bunting and then like five or six guys. It wasn't even like Bunting. <laughs> bless you. It wasn't even Bunting and then uh, Cider and then a bunch of guys. They had Cider in a group with like Tanner Janot. Um, also, Timothy Lilligren, they said, was in that similar group, which I thought was real interesting. That's interesting too. But Michael Bunting, here's the statistic that I'm going to drop on you. I, I got into this the other day on Leafs Launch. So I got. I got some facts and stats to back this up because I believe he is deserving of the Calder. Whether or not he wins it, again, I think your your line of thinking is correct where people just automatically believe it should go to Maureen Sider. And you could you know rattle off the reasons why. He's a defenseman. He plays in all situations. He's younger. And, uh, you know, he's a defenseman who's putting up just gross offensive numbers that doesn't come around a whole lot. That's all true. But Michael Bunting is also doing those things as well. And and he's doing it. It's his first full season in the NHL, and he's knocking on the door of 70 points. Michael Bunting, if you look at the numbers, dude, at five on five, right? And, and, and I had to double check, triple check this statistic because I thought it was so wild. But at five on five, he has more points than Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Kirill Kaprizov, Nathan McKinnon, Patrick Kane. Do I need to go on and, and, and rattle off a bunch more names, or is that enough for you? The fact that he legitimately is outproducing all of those players at 5-on-5, five five, and, and you're not ready to hand this guy the award? He's a point-per-game player since the All-Star game. Point-per-game player since the All-Star game. A lot of those being primaries as well. A majority of them being primary points. So it's not just the fact that he is tagging alongside Matthews and Marner. Look, Nick Ritchie tagged alongside Matthews and Marner early in the year. How did that work out? Not very well. Hyman was tagging along with Matthews and Marner last year. He never put up a 70-point season. Like Michael Bunting is, to me a terrific hockey player. He's fourth in the NHL in individual expected goals. That's an individual statistic. That's him going to the net, having a nose for the net, being in the right areas, working his tail off to get into those dirty, gritty areas, to get those opportunities and those grade A chances. 1,000% he deserves it. And here's how I dismantle the, he's 26 and he's a pro. You know, he's he's more NHL ready than a guy like Mo Sider. Michael Bunting is... Six foot, 180 pounds. Most cider is six foot four, 200 pounds. Who's more of a, like, whose body is filled out more so, I guess? Who's got more of that man strength to compete in the NHL? Mo cider at six four, 200, or uh, Michael Bunting at six foot is what he's listed at. That might even be a little generous if I say so myself, and a buck 85. So if you talk about the size component for him being older, his body's grown, he's more mature, I don't think that's really a good argument. The second argument to that, oh, Michael Bunting's played pro hockey. He's been with, uh, you know, the AHL in the last couple of seasons. 
please, Dave, do you want to explain where uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Mo Sider, has played his last three or four years of hockey? Five yeah. years almost of hockey? I think it's with other bigger German players. In the professional ranks as well. So if you want to use the pro hockey debate, he's also played four or five years of pro hockey before his rookie season in the NHL. And he so played that in- also toss that out the window. And when you look at the age eligibility, he's 25, 26. He's eligible. There are certain requirements, age requirements for eligibility. You either are or you aren't. Don't use it against him that he's slightly older than this guy. There's an eligibility requirement for a reason. If he was 38 years old doing this, all right, you got something there. But the fact that he did already clear the requirements to be eligible for the award, that to me settles that conversation altogether. What do you think? Did I sell you? Did I, I sell think, you? Look, I think Michael Bunny has been phenomenal. I think he'll be second. Actually, no, I still think Trevor Zegers will likely get votes because he's the flashier player. It's not a perfect system when it comes to these voting. If we're thinking about this and other people are definitely thinking about it and you know, you know, what's funny though. You know, what's funny. We're having this conversation, right? I've had numerous conversations with people and everybody says the same thing. Oh, we know the voters, the voters do this last year. If we look at the ballot, a majority of people would say the voters got it right. The voters were right. Yeah. So I wonder if now when you bring in analytics and you, you talk about the way the industry is changing and a lot of the voters are younger and have more adaptive to analytics, they have more information at their disposal. If the mind, the shift, there's a shift also coming in the way that people vote. And remember when I talked about how people cling on to that first bit of information, it's almost like a couple of years ago. Remember everyone said Aaron or um, Alex Barkov, the most underrated player in hockey, right? That was what everyone said every time, anytime you're asked. Well, if everyone believes that this guy's the most underrated player in hockey, is he really the most underrated player in hockey? If that's the consensus answer across the board? No, I don't think so. So if every single person you talk to sitting here saying, oh, I think the voters are going to do it based on the age. They shouldn't, but I believe they will. Don't you think the voters are having the same conversation themselves? We shouldn't do it based on age. And every year this conversation comes up when there's an older uh, an older um, participant. Kirill Kaprizov was 24, played multiple years of pro hockey. That didn't hinder him. He got the trophy. Artemi Panarin played multiple years of pro hockey. He was 24, 25, whatever he was when he won it. That didn't hinder him. He won over Connor McDavid. I think they will do the exact same thing with Michael Bunting. It's just what we talk about. But at the end of the day, when you actually break it down, the voters do get this right a lot of the time when it comes to this. Uh, And I think Michael Bunting is not only deserving, but I hope they give this man the trophy because he – is most deserving of it, I would say. He's had the best rookie season of all the rooks, and that's what this award is. Not most valuable rookie, who's the best, who had the best season. And to me, that's Michael Bunting, the man who's outproduced. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Kirill Kaprizov, Nate McKinnon, all at 5-on-5. I rest my case. I'm just trying to make the mic drop sound. Actually, I have a mic right here. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, he can't drop the he can't drop the work mic. No, can't do that. I caught it, but I dropped it. For those on YouTube, you saw it happen. Yeah. Um, I, I think you make a good case. Um I, I would like to see Bunting get more recognition than I think people are giving him. It's just you have to think about who's voting on it. They've been better at it, but they're not perfect. And yeah. Cider's still having a good year. <laughs> so if he get if he gets it, I wouldn't say that Bunting was robbed. I just say, I just hope it's for the right reasons and not because of age. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough, Dave. And uh, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. I got a little heated. That's my guy. That's my guy. Bunts. Love him. Love him. Hopefully he gets rewarded for the year he's having. Uh, Because he's not being rewarded uh, in the bank account. Because 
you'll be making less than a schmill next year as well. <laughs> That's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You'd subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcast platforms. You receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Vicky underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morisuti. And follow the show at Locked On Leafs. Make sure that you like, comment, subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we would definitely appreciate that. We'll be back with another episode for y'all tomorrow. We'll be breaking down tonight's game with the Leafs going down to Tampa. Should be a fun one. Until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.